here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is The C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of Richard Strange, he of Doctors of Madness, who's got various projects on at the moment, including the release of Walk of Shame. This is, this is a single from here. His um, last album, which was produced by John Leckie and remixed by Martin Ware. And um, it does feature um, an all-star cast of Joe Elliott from Def Leppard and also Terry Edwards, who's worked with a million people on saxophone. Also, which is very excited, um, he's going to be releasing his memoir, Strange, Punks and Drunks and Flicks and Kicks, as an audiobook for the first time, and that's also now available, so um, do check that out. We will be talking about all these things within the show, and um, yes, there's various other things. Anyway, look, I'm not going to bore you anymore, <laughs> just for a change. So this is going to be, yes, after several minutes, lots of uh, chat about this and that, mostly about our health, really, which has all been edited out, but that's probably the best bit. Uh, we got down to that very exciting subject of when Richard... Mr. Strange was last in Norwich, well, just touring, with a fantastic all-star cast band doing the work of Lou Reed, which I saw at the Norwich Arts Centre. Anyway, I mentioned this, and this is now where Richard picks it up and takes it forward. Richard, it's over to you. I mean, that for me was one of the happiest uh, and most fulfilling tours I've ever done. I mean... It was a band made in heaven for a start. It was Kevin Armstrong, Terry Edwards, Dave Imby, Flo Sabeva, and Paul Cardiford, you know, and they're just, just like, not only are they consummate musicians who've got nothing to prove, they are just really lovely people. And it was like, um, when Terry first called me about that, it must have been 2019, I guess. Yeah, summer 2019. And he said to me, what are you doing uh, at, at the end of summer? I said, I think I'm in Japan. I'm touring Japan until September, I think it was. And he said, and then what are you doing when you get back? I said, well, nothing at the moment. And he said, but how would you like to do Richard Strange Sings the Songs of Lou Reed as a UK tour? I said, I'd love to do that. What a brilliant idea. He said, I'm glad you said that because... We started arranging the tour. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, okay. And then I said, well, we're, we're going to need a band. And he said, well, funny you should say that. I've got these people keen to do it. And it was just a dream band. It was like going into a sweet shop. And then they said, what songs would you like to do? We'd, how about we don't do Velvet Underground songs, but we do post Velvet songs, but lose characters, the characters, you know, so the, you know, the, 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 the quintessential Lou character song, obviously, is Walk on the Wild Side, you know, Holly came from Miami, yeah. Edna, Miami and, you know, but then you've got Sally Can't Dance, you've got the songs from Berlin, you've got My Friend George, you've got um, uh, um, uh, Stephanie Says, and, you, you know, suddenly, You've got this whole dramatis personae of Lou Reed's life, and they're all like little Polaroid snapshots that Nan Golden or someone might have taken, you know, of, or, or Robert Mapplethorpe or someone right. might have taken, of a very specific place and time in, uh, in um, counterculture, modern, you know, you know, pop culture, I guess, in New York, but, you know, in the 70s, the 80s and early 90s, I guess. And it was an incredibly attractive idea. And I said, well, look, let's use Sweet Jane as a kickoff point so that we tip our head to the velvets and then we just go into all this other fabulous stuff that he did, you know. And that's what we did, Wild Child, you know, from uh, the first Lou album. And um, uh, and then we did a couple of um, uh, rarities like Disco Mystic and uh, uh, Street Hassle, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. But just 
but brilliant to do it. And this band, I mean, we had two days rehearsal. Um, uh, and I'd just come back from uh, Japan. I was knackered and I thought, oh, this is going to be really grueling. But it was like going in and having your favorite jukebox. You put a 10p in and Sweet Jane came out, but not just Sweet Jane from uh, uh, Loaded, but Sweet Jane from Rock and Roll Animal. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, yeah, fantastic. So that's what we did. And we did about 10 shows around the UK. And um, I think they were the last shows I did. Yes. Did you do anything from the album New York? Because that was one of my favourite albums of the 80s, New York. We did. Do, is is my friend George from New York? Or God, I can't we remember. definitely did something from New York. Uh, um, because it was on, one me... of it was one of those albums. Because you never know, a bit like Bob Dylan and Van Morrison, you kind of slightly dread when an album comes out by someone like you know, thinking it could be absolutely awful. Or it could be yeah. Something. But New York just dropped, and it was just like, oh my god, this is absolutely amazing. From yeah, first... I think I think we did something from more or less every album. So you know, from the uh, what was it called, the Blue Mask, and the. Um, um, uh, what was it called? New Sensations, all, yeah, all that stuff, yeah. Yes, now I can remember. Because you've got, you know, you're, you, the influence you've had on, on music has been quite extraordinary, isn't it? Because you are the, the person who almost, I wouldn't say invented punk, but you were there before punk, but you were punk before that even happened. Before We were, world. but you don't get any medals for that, unfortunately. <laughs> except 40 years later, someone says something nice about you in The Guardian, you know, but at the time... It's a terrible place to be because, yeah, 1974, when I formed Doctors of Madness, Velvet Underground and Bowie had happened, but punk hadn't happened. And I was always into William Burroughs. William Burroughs and, uh, and contemporary art were my big uh, inspirations, more than music, really. I still don't think of myself as being especially musical, but I love, I love, I love a good lyric and I love a good picture. Um, and I could, I could conceptualize what my band was going to be long before I could conceptualize what we were going to uh, play in terms of a, a musical genre. I knew we were going to be slightly cartoonish, slightly sci-fi. We were going to be political. We were going to be iconoclastic. Uh, we were going to be unreal and confrontational. All those things I knew before I'd written a single song. Um, and then gradually that's what we became. And for, uh, for about a year and a half, two years, it was really hard work because prog rock had been happening. Yes. You know, we were everything that prog rock wasn't, you know, and uh, we were not virtuoso, we were not, interested in doing our show on ice or in, in uh, <laughs> <Capes>. <laughs> uh, 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 Wembley, you know, or, um, you, you know, or, or even doing the triple album. We were, we were a weird sort of uh, uh, um, juxtaposition, but, you know, one of our songs called Main Lines was 16 minutes long or something, but other songs were two minutes and, and played at 144 BPM and no one did that. No one did a song like Waiting, their first song on our first album, um, which went one, two, three, four, you know, and like oh, up and running. So it was hard to sell us, but people did, some people did get us, but it was very difficult to, to sell us because we weren't easily uh, uh, categorizable, if you like, and to put, oh, they're pub rock. We were never pub rock. You no, know? you weren't we were glam rock. You weren't rock. You weren't glam. We were a either, little bit glam, but we were a bit too, uh, a bit, we were art school, I guess, but we didn't go to art school even, you know, so get out of that one. But, you know, gradually, we evolved our style and our sound, and uh, even listening back to it now, you know, some things I would change, but a lot of it I'm quite proud of. But it got to the point where almost in spite of ourselves, we 
had an album out, a couple of albums out. We'd been signed to a major record company and a management manager and stuff. And we were getting six, 700 people a night coming to see us on tour. Um, so this was in, in, the, in, a, in a way the halcyon days of touring rock and roll when every university had a student union that would put on a gig. You yes. know, and it was it was cheap beer, but it was uh, it was great bands. Um, and every night, you know, we, we, we there was a gig somewhere. So we were doing that and uh, we were doing fine. And of course, as you look into the future, you think, well, this is OK, because what happens in rock and roll is you start to hit by your third album and, you know, 30 years later, you're the Rolling Stones or Pink Floyd or something, and you're, you're on Moustique with Princess Margaret. <laughs> so what could possibly go wrong? So, you know, that, that paradigm was playing out. Uh, and I got a call from my agent, Martin Hopewell, saying that I need you to do me a favor. I've got this manager in London who's calling me every day. He needs some gigs for his band um, outside of London. They've done one show at St. Martin's Art School. They've got a bit of a bad reputation, but they're not bad kids. Would you let them support you uh, in Middlesbrough or whatever? He said they're called the Sex Pistols. You know, so I'd sort of heard of them and I'd heard about the gig they did at St. Martin's and I'd heard about this guy, Malcolm McLaren. And, you know, I thought, well, I think I'd probably rather have the Sex Pistols support me than have Genesis support me, or yes, you know, so. Um, and, and also I felt, well, I'd been where they were, you know, in, a, in, in a, an un, uncaring world where no one would support you because you, you weren't the flavor of that particular month. Yes. Um, so we said yes, and I was, watching them do their sound check. And I, I was thinking, I don't really know what all the fuss is about. And not, there wasn't a lot of fuss, but they'd had bits written about them. But then when I saw them in, on stage in front of our audience, I knew the show was over for me. I knew something had happened. There'd been a seismic shift in, um, and it was generational, right. then, I guess it was, a, yeah. A generation in pop music is two years, three years, you know. You, if you've got a sibling within two or three years of you, you might listen to the same thing. Four years, forget it. You're going to listen to something else. Yeah, it is, uh, in it is interesting because I think, um, you know, every sort of four or five years, that kind of time span, the 16-year-old or 18-year-old, well, 16, 15, 17, you know, they want their sound. They don't really want what Absolutely. happened a few years down the line. And I've kind of noticed that quite a bit. And yes, it, it is quite strange. But then at the same time, it is kind of weird because you did have sort of, you had Brian Morrison, didn't you? Who was your manager. Yeah. He was kind of the big cheese. And he'd, I mean, Mark Boland, his, his, he was definitely waning at that stage, wasn't he? At, you know, yeah, he, well, I mean, Brian was a funny one because Brian didn't have any musical talent at all, but he just had golden ears. Brian discovered, well, Brian was, funny enough, a student at St. Martin's Art School, uh, um, uh, as was a band called The Pretty Things. And Brian didn't have any musical talent, but he liked the idea of the, the rock and roll business or the pop business, as it was then called, because it was an entree to girls and, 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 and high living, you know. So if he couldn't play, he would manage them. <laughs> and then someone said to Brian, look, the world's changing in, 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 in pop music. The money's not in management anymore, it's in publishing. So Brian decided to be a music publisher. So uh, there was nothing to it in those days. You just called yourself a music publisher and he signed, uh, the compositions of a band and at that time the bands just started writing their own songs for the first time up until then they'd been songwriters and they'd been groups yes. or, or solo figures you know uh, but it was only with the Beatles and then the Stones and the Kinks and the Small Faces that they all started writing their own songs so Brian signed the pretty things and then genius that he was 
He went down to Charing uh, um, Cross Road one day where there were lots of uh, secondhand record shops. He found a, a secondhand record of the Chinese national anthem. And he looked on both sides of it and it, it said, no one published it in the UK. So Brian got someone to um, transcribe musical transcription of the Chinese national anthem, called himself the publisher in the UK of the Chinese national anthem, right? And um, it was the year of the Olympics. And so every time China won a medal and went up and collected a medal and the national anthem played, Brian collected a royalty. <laughs> he's, he's about 18 or 19. And then he signed T-Rex, he signed Mark Bowden, then he signed Pink Floyd uh, and Fairport Convention and so on, so on, so so, so forth. Uh, and I, I, I remember that he made so much money by the time we first started gigging that he'd retired um, and was playing polo. You know, it sounds like Spinal Tap, I know, yes. but he was. Um, and when Doctor the Madness started, I booked us into a pub in Twickenham where we did four shows in four consecutive weekends. And the first week, 20 people came. The second week, 30 people came. Fourth week, 120 people came. And the fourth week, we were brilliant. Uh, and we got a knock on the door. And the first person who came in was Jonathan King saying, I manage a band called Genesis. Uh, and if you're interested in turning professional, I'd be interested in representing you. I hated Genesis. Yes. And I didn't like Jonathan King very much either. So we sort of showed him the door and the band said to me, you're fucking mad, you know. We were a semi-pro band doing a pub in Twickenham and Genesis manager comes in and says, I'd like to sign you. And you've just sent him away. <laughs> I said, yeah, but I hate Genesis. <laughs> anyway, five minutes later, another knock on the door, and you couldn't make this up. A cigar comes in, and, a, you know, like an a 18 inch cigar comes in, followed by Brian Morrison smoking. <laughs> uh, and he said, um, I've been recommended to come and see you. you. You kids have got something. If you're serious about turning professional, come and see me on Monday at my office. He gave us his card and we went in on Monday. And he was in Mayfair, and sure enough, gold discs on all the walls, Pink Floyd, T-Rex, you know, BGs was another one that he published. Um, and he said, you know, you've got something. Are you serious? We said, we're serious. He said, well, you can see what I can do. I've seen what you can do. So we give it a go. So we signed our contracts and, you know, of course, no legal uh, uh, eye was ever cast over those contracts. So I ended up signing away about 140% of all my possible earnings for the rest of my life. But on that Monday morning, I was a professional musician. I was no longer a semi-pro with a job at Cheapo Cheapo Records in Berwick Street. Yes. I was a pro musician on 25 quid a week and he put us into a rehearsal room in Charing Cross for six weeks and said work on your show, work on your songs, work on your who you are, what you look like, what your you know what they would now call what is your brand. They yes. didn't spot it they now. And we did that, and he was in um, partnership with a guy called Justin de Villeneuve, who was Twiggy's manager. And he's the photographer, we, isn't he? He was a photographer. He did Bowie's uh, pinups cover, yeah. Right. But he was, uh, he, he'd been a hairdresser. He discovered Twiggy. He was Twiggy's manager, Twiggy's photographer. They made a fortune. And then Brian and Justin got together to get back into the music business in 1975, which is when they discovered us. And we sort of ticked all the boxes because we were quite theatrical. We were uh, different, you know, and, and, uh, and, and very naive. So we signed to them and um, six weeks into this rehearsal, they started getting Clive Davis to come and see us and Ahmed Ertegun and, and, you know, just absolute giants of the pop business to come and see. And the, the, the shtick was always the same. Play three songs, don't talk to them, leave the talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we did. And we signed to 
Polydor Records, Phonograph Records then for a three album deal. And we were up and running. You know, we went out and did a big tour with Bebop Deluxe, who were the big Great White Hope of uh, EMI Records at that time. We went out and did Manchester Free Trade Hall and Glasgow Apollo and London Drury Lane and Bristol, Bristol Colston Hall, you know, all the big gigs. Um, before before they started doing gigs in stadiums, they were the big gigs, the town halls and the, the civic yes. centre and the universities. And we did all that and we were up and running. So and, and you know, did you get quite... did you get much pressure when you, you know, after being in the studio? Because it was just interesting, because kind of quite recently I did an interview with another band with the word Doctor Doctor and the Medics. And um, Is that Doctor and the Medics? Yes. Right. With um and uh, they were just a band, you know, he'd run a club. Is his name Clive, who's he was the main bloke on Doctor and the Medics. I think his name is Clive. Anyway, right. so he ran a club in London, then they develop a band, and then suddenly they find themselves kind of being signed by, to IRS records with the, the famous yeah. um, Copeland. Uh, That's like, right, yeah, uh, IRS. Yeah. Who, who sounds like one of those caricatures from a Spinal Tap film where, you know, the rest of the band go next door to go to the, you know, keep drinking, and they leave, you know, the lead singer to sort of deal with the sort of the big... <laughs> And 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 suddenly Miles is doing one of those. I can't hear a fucking hit. I can't hear. You gotta go and get a fucking hit on this song. And they're going, what the hell? And that's when they do. You know, okay, we'll just. And the band come back and said, how did it go? And he said, well, this. You know, he he relates the story. And they go and do Spirit in the Sky. As they're like, well, yeah. we've got to do it. So you know, and that's the one thing that kind of kills their career because it's suddenly, yeah. like he said. That he didn't read the contract, you know, they had been on, you know, Todd Pops, all the number ones, all the big tours, and he was kind of labouring on the building site six months later, still trying to yeah. pay the rent. So yeah, did you yeah. ever have that kind of pressure when you said, right, this is what we've got? And did they ever say, this is it, guys? Or did they say, I can't hear the hit? No, funnily enough, they never did. But then I, I guess... Brian Morrison would probably not have heard a hit with Pink Floyd when Sid Barrett was there. You know, it was not. And, and T-Rex, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex. You're not hearing hits say You're just seeing something that's different and that appeals to you. Yes. Uh, and, and the same with Twiggy. You know, Twiggy was not Gene Shrimpton or, you know, the classic uh, um, upper middle class uh, uh, the daughter of a retired major or a, 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 a rector, you know, she was a working class girl. And so both Brian and Justin had that instinct, I suppose, for, for, for what interested them or what excited them. And when they saw us, as I say, they couldn't really categorize it, but they thought that's what we like about it, that it is different. It's, it's like, you know, when I used to go and see Bowie or Roxy music or, or even Roy Harper, John Martin, Al Stewart, uh, Bert Yanch, when I saw those people, I knew that was English folk music, Bob Dylan, of course, you know. Yeah. But um, I think it was the words that I was attracted to with them as much, if not more, than the music. And the attitude, the attitude that they were iconoclastic, that they didn't really care, they were rebellious, they were political. I always loved that. And that's, you know, Roy Harper, funny enough, used to live with us. And Roy was the most awkward bugger, you know, who, who you know, would shoot himself in the foot commercially almost on a, on a daily basis, you know. Um, and I sort of took that on. I thought everything everything I wrote, I thought, how would Roy fuck this up? <laughs> <laughs> but then you know, I then, mean we but going back to Roy Harper, when you heard something like She's the One, did you think, God, this is kind of musical genius? Yeah. Yeah. But then he would do Magoo's Blues, like 35 minute long song. Or he'd do I Hate the White Man. Yeah, that's going to get played on the radio, sure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but then, you know. And then Roy got sucked into the whole Led Zeppelin thing, you know, and he, he, he just fell in love with the lifestyle. 
Yes. Uh, which was his undoing in a way. And he thought he was Led Zeppelin rather than knowing that Led Zeppelin loved him because he wasn't Led Zeppelin. You know what I mean? This is true. But Roy it's quite interesting because about... because earlier today I did an interview with Rose, who was in the Incredible String Band, who, you know, was one of those yeah. most bizarre musical outfits. And, you know, so I've been late listening to a lot of Incredible String Band in the last 24 hours, yeah. which I do every five years thinking, am I going to get it this time? And wow that's amazing but they're critically so acclaimed aren't they you know and and lyrically yeah, are just yeah. kind of out there you know williamson and, so uh, out there so out there you know i used to when i was 15 for better or worse the things that i loved most was that english folk music so it was al stewart uh bert yansh roy harper john renborn john martin i guess those five jackson frank bob dylan Paul Simon, I, that was what I loved in music. I also loved the beat writers, so Kerouac, Burroughs and Ginsberg, and you know, then Dylan Thomas and William Blake and stuff like that. And then I loved contemporary art. This is when I'm 15 years old. So I bunk off school, not to go and meet girls or to go train spotting, but rather tragically to go to the Robert Fraser Gallery in Duke Street to see a show by, uh, Robert Rauschenberg or something, you know, mm. or, or, or uh, Jim Dine or, or something like that. So what about what about Edward Hopper? Did you ever like the work of Edward Hopper and the Night Hall? I did, but not not back then. I mean, that went over my head. I mean, I, I, I think I liked the flash of pop art, which is why when I heard in 1966, 67, that the coolest man in the world, Andy Warhol, had taken on a rock band called The Velvet Underground. I didn't even have to hear a note. I knew I was going to love them. <laughs> then I saw a photo, and they all wore shades indoors. You know? <laughs> and, you know, and it, was, it was this weird sort of coming together of New York art world, which was the coolest thing in the world. The Beats, because Lou Reed was a, an English major at, uh, um, at uh, Columbus University. John Cale was studying classical composition with Lamont Young and, and the Fluxus people. Uh, and they've got this German fashion model singing with them. You know, you just think, it's just genius. Then when we got the album in 1967, we went to One Stop Records in South Bolton Street and actually bought the American import, which cost like three times as much as the English record. Okay? You put it on and the first track you hear is Sunday Morning. And you think, no, no. <laughs> uh, but then you hear Waiting for the Man and, and Venus in Furs and, you know, Black Angel Death Song or, or, or uh, European Sun or you know, any of that stuff. And you think, yes, yes, yes. But it's um, interesting, I had, I had the same experience because in those, in the, I suppose I got it in the 80s, but probably the early 80s was my brother had one of those rock books. The only way you could find out about music was those kind of, you know, the Rolling Stone 100 to 500 best albums. And it'd always be, yeah. you know, Melvin Gaye, wasn't it? What's going on? Pet Sounds, you know, Van Morrison, The Beatles. And then this kind of, you know, Velvet Underground would be somewhere in the top 20 with Ziggy yeah, Stardust. Always, yeah. So I had sort of read about it and went to the record library, got it, you know, and you kind of read the review and it doesn't make much sense. And you put on and thinking, God, this is not quite what I expected. Like you, you know, thinking, yeah. God, your mum would like this. You know, and it was quite romantic because I used to love, you know, all that L Stewart, you know, time passages, you, the cat, you know, that was my period. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, um, and suddenly it's like, oh, wait a minute, waiting for the man, you know, or, to, you know, or tomorrow's parties, oh, I'll I, be I, your I, mirror. And, and, then, like, and, then, and then the next album, I mean, White Light, White Heat, when you got Sister Ray, and then you think, yeah, this is it. And by which time they were in meltdown anyway, but by which time, you know, I, I, I was hooked and I thought, this is what I'm going to do because. I, I always, as I said, I, I had this idea. William Burroughs, contemporary art, probably a bit of Bowie, a lot of Lou Reed, um, a bit of Dylan, um, Jacques Brel. That was all the stuff that went into my songs, you know, be, before we'd even been signed by Morrison. It was 
they were the influences much more than straight up and down music, you know, it was not like, I want to sound like the Beatles or I want to sound like the Stones. I couldn't if I tried. I just don't know, I, I don't have it within me to sound like anyone of, of those bands. Um, so even doing the Lou Reed thing last year, a couple of years ago, I wasn't trying to imitate Lou. I was trying to interpret Lou and that's, that, that's the difference. I was trying to channel, funnel, whatever you want to call it. Yes. Uh, well, there was another... I, know, I know my own musical limitations all too well. And I think if I ever tried to sound like anyone, it would be an unmitigated disaster. So I, <laughs> I just do what I do and hope someone somewhere will like it. Yes, well, I think a couple of years ago, it's probably longer now than just two, there's a, an, uh, I think she's an Irish singer called Camille O'Sullivan, who does the work of David Bowie and Nick Cave, you know, and again does the same thing, you know, taking the songs and sort of making them her yeah. own with her kind of style, with her sta stage performance. And they yeah. are kind of captivating evenings because suddenly, oh, and Leonard Cohen as well. Um, because, you know, you obviously get to appreciate the song quite differently. If, and, and I think that's kind of quite important because otherwise doing a straight cover, you must just listen to the original. So doing it and, you know, a, a different interpretation of those lyrics can be quite yeah. stunning. Really. Yeah. But then what was quite boggling when, well, there's several things, because about the last three people I've interviewed recent, very recently, they all got heroin addictions. And, you know, this is kind of early years of rock and roll. How did you kind of navigate those worlds and periods of kind of like, like avoiding? I, I suppose my... Oh, that's a guitar falling over. Uh, uh, I suppose my drugs of choice were, were um, amphetamine and alcohol rather than um, uh, hallucinogenics or, or opiates. So they're a little bit safer, I guess. Um, it, that period from mid 70s through to mid 80s, it's not a, a, a lost decade, but I know that a lot of a lot of the work I did then was was drug or alcohol fueled. I mean, not least the when the doctors finished, and I thought, well, what can I do now? It's 1978. We've been rendered sort of redundant by punk rock by then. Um, we fulfilled our contracts, but no one was review, renewing them. And I had to do what I now, sorry, I'm just going to move this chair slightly. Um, what I now tell my students or, or recommend to students when I teach is reflective practice. What are you good at? What went well there? What didn't go well? What could you do better? What were the lessons learned from that three or four years of making music from 1974? to 1978. I thought I'm a pretty good front man. I'm a, I, I, I can conceptualize a show. I'm a, I can write songs and uh, I'm pretty good on the telephone, but I didn't want to work in a call center. So that was sort of out. <laughs> um, so I, I, when the doctors finished in 1978, I'd already started thinking about this uh, sounds so old fashioned and quaint now, a concept album of a guy who uses his knowledge of showbiz manipulation, advertising, crowd control, propaganda, all that stuff, to become president of a united Europe at some point in the future, right? Um, and fueled by vast quantities of amphetamine, I started to write something called The Phenomenal Rise of Richard Strange, in which I am that guy uh, who, who becomes president. And the more I wrote it, the more I got into that character and the more, and that was, that was sort of informed by a lot of great 
European new wave films that were happening at the time, especially Italian films like the um, uh, uh, the Matai Affair and uh, Illustrious Corpses and stuff like that. Uh, and I saw this character and I saw how he comes into poli politics cynically, almost as a, a, a game, as an exercise, as a, uh, a, a, a challenge. And once he's in power in this notional European state, he becomes politicized and he becomes radicalized and he actually wants to do good rather than just uh, 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 cynically exploit his, his fame, his popularity and his position. I thought that's quite an interesting uh, uh, narrative. So I started writing that and then I toured the States with it, with just a tape recorder. I did all the backing tracks uh, on a two track Revox. And I toured America uh, with just a guitar, live vocals and these songs on backing tapes and just did a different town every night. Because I had a, a little bit of a reputation in America because the doctors, although the Docs of Madness had been absolutely killed by a, a, a high profile NBC documentary that had been made about us, uh, which was shown on prime time and whose uh, principal uh, 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 narrative thread was that we were a talented, a talentless bunch of hooligans who'd been taken up by these two Svengali managers who wanted to make millions out of us. And of course, uh, that smacked, of course, of we were the monkeys or something. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so America didn't really happen for Dogs of Madness, uh, but some people did still like it. So I was, I was touring a very small, low level. Uh, and I came back to New York, having been all around the country for six weeks, eight weeks or something, doing somewhere different every night. And Michael Zilker from Z Records uh, had been a Docs of the Madness fan. And he came to a show that I did in New York. He said, I'd love to do a, a live album with you. And I, I said, well, a live album, I'm working with backing tapes. He said, yeah, I know, but that's a Z sort of thing. You know? <laughs> so we did a live album and that was called The Live Rise of Richard Strange. So then I got back to London and I thought, I really enjoyed doing that. What I don't want to do is be in a band. What I don't want to do is play the marquee and the hundred club. Uh, so again, reflective practice. What do I want to do? I want to open my own club. That's like a multimedia, mixed media cabaret club. And so I opened something called Cabaret Futura in uh, in Soho in 1980, 81, and put on six or eight things a night: spoken word, poetry, uh, alternative comedy was just starting up. Video art was just starting up. Uh, I put on dance and stuff, uh, electronic uh, synth bands and so on. And I was up and running again. And Richard Branson got in touch and said, do you want to put your record out with um, Virgin Records, The Phenomenal Rise of Richard Strain? So I was back on the horse again, you know, having been chucked off in 1978. <laughs> By 1980, I was back on the horse and uh, I was, I was, I wasn't flavor of the month, but I could get a meeting with anyone because my club was doing well and because my name was up there again. Yeah, it's a bit like, I guess I'm, because I did an interview with a guy from a band called The and the Native Hipsters, a William Wilden. And I think he did a, a few sort of songs and this album in the late seventies and then opened a comedy club in the eighties. And he yeah. developed an act himself where I think he just used to get a lot of vinyl records and smash on stage. And then they'd mention <laughs> that um, it was, was his, name? Of, his name is William Wildin, Wildin. And um, yeah, that's really the bell, actually, yeah. And I think he would try and provoke the crowd in which record that you would save and which one you'd smash up. And, yeah, and I think he played my club, actually. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, back then, 1981, again, I, I found the premises in, uh, in Soho and we were doing this once a week. And I was putting on, a, you know, bands like uh, Depeche Mode did their first gig there, Soft Cell did their first London gig there, 
the Pogues did their first London gig there. And, you know, a lot of the comedians, Alexis Sale and um, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, uh, Keith Allen and people like that came and did their stand up shows there. And I was up and running again. And what happened? Then, because, you know, punk had happened, punk had finished, then he'd had this sort of the, the, the post-punk thing, the Echo and the Bunnymen and the Teardrop Explodes and, and the, um, all the electronic stuff, going into Soft Cell and going into uh, um, Depeche Mode and so on. And suddenly everything was a bit arty again. Yes. Come out of this nihilistic, I'm bored, uh, you know, I'm bored and drunk thing of, of the late 70s, mid, mid late 70s, into everyone was creative, darling. You know, and so, and if you genuinely were, which I always have been, for better or worse, you were up and running. So the club became for me, firstly, a brilliant place to network with uh, people that I wanted to collaborate with. Uh, in different different disciplines, but also because I was doing music differently and I was doing it quite theatrically, people, <clears throat> or you know, a, a few people, someone, assumed that I wanted to be an actor, which I didn't really. But I got an introduction to a, a film director called um, Frank Rodham, who made a, a, a movie called uh, Quadrophenia. And he was about to make a movie with Sting called The Bride. And someone introduced me to him and I didn't get a part in it, but he introduced me to an agent. And she said, well, what training have you had? I've said, nothing, nothing, you know. Uh, but Frank said, come and see you. Frank said, with my voice and with my look, I'll always work is what he said. <laughs> uh, so, she said, well, all right, darling, we'll take you on for three months or so. And I was really lucky. I've always been lucky, David. I've always been lucky. And so I've always landed on my feet somehow. So she took me on for three months. And literally within a couple of weeks, I'd got a small part in a very stupid film with Mel Smith and Griff Reese jones called Morons About a Space. <laughs> and then I got uh, a couple of small TV things. Then I got a role in Mona Lisa with uh, um, Bob Hoskins, Bob Hoskins and, and Neil, Neil Jordan film. Then um, I was sort of up and running. And then next thing I know, there's they're uh, auditioning for roles in Batman in London because they're going to shoot it at Pinewood. And I go down there and my, my agent by this time thinks, oh, we, 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 we got somebody who's really lucky with me, because I, I got a lot of parts, got a lot of commercials as well, and the commercials back then always used to pay quite well. So I went to this Batman thing, and again, I got it. I walked in and I got it with Tim Burton, and it's Jack Nicholson, and it's Kim Bassinger, and it's uh, Michael Keaton and stuff. You know, you just think, this is fantastic. You know, you get paid <laughs> really well for doing you know, for going into a, a make-believe museum with Jack Nicholson and trashing a Rembrandt. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yes. I, I, I was up and running. So this is 1988, 1988, 89. I heard that um, uh, a director, a theatre director, who I really loved, uh, a Russian called uh, Yuri Lubimov, who I'd seen do um, Dostoevsky pieces in London. He did Crime and Punishment and he did The Idiot uh, on stage in London. Brilliant productions, very physical, very visual. And I said to my agent rather grandly, I hear Lubimov's casting for a world tour of Hamlet. He said, darling, that's Shakespeare. I said, yeah, I know, but that's going to be a fun tour, isn't it? He said, this is going to be for Royal Shakespeare Company people, National Theatre people, you know. I said, when's he, uh, when's your destiny? He said, uh, this coming weekend at the, uh, the YMCA in Tottenham Court Road. 
I said, could you go in to see me? He's like, you just don't take no for an answer, do you? I said, well, no, it, it does sound fun. Um, so she managed to get me an audition. And that's the start of the problem, because now I've got to learn a bit of Shakespeare for you. <laughs> right? so, <laughs> which I'd never done in my life. So I phoned a friend of mine, a director friend of mine, Michael Crompton. I said, Michael, I've got a problem. I've got to have a bit of Shakespeare prepared for tomorrow for Yuri Lebibov. He said, what for tomorrow? He said, what have you got in mind? I said, I haven't got a clue. Can I come over and can we do, a, can, can I work on something uh, for a couple of hours with you? So on the bus on the way over to him, I think my only chance of getting this job is to make sure that I don't do anything that anyone else is going to do. So there's no comparison. <laughs> He was good. He was rubbish. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Good um, idea. So on my way over, I'm discounting all the Shakespearean speeches that anyone of my age and gender is going to do. Which gives me the idea, Cleopatra. Female role. Right. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So on the bus over, I think... It, there's that scene in Cleopatra where Mark Antony marries Octavia. And by the time I got to Michael, I said, Cleopatra finds out Mark Antony is back. He said, are you serious? We've got two hours. I said, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we did Cleopatra's speech on hearing that Mark Antony has married Octavia. And we got it to a point where it was, you know, like uh, village hall godalming awful. Uh, you know, by the time we had to finish, I said, Mike, thanks very much. That's brilliant. I went in the next day, sitting outside the auditions, and sure enough, I'm hearing, you know, Michael Bryan and uh, uh, Michael Goff and uh, uh, David Suchet saying, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this, you know, thinking, thank God I didn't do that. <laughs> Once more under the breach, you know, <laughs> Uh, if music be the food of love, but, you know, no. So eventually I'm ushered in. It's like waiting in the dentist's waiting room, hearing all these guys going through, and then eventually I'm in there. Lubimov is right there at the end with his interpreter, because Lubimov doesn't speak a word of English. And his interpreter said to me, so will you tell Mr. Lubimov what you've done on stage recently? <laughs> and I said, well, will you tell Mr. Lubimov? Not only have I not done anything on stage recently, I have never done anything on stage in my life, except I was the lead singer with the proto-punk rock band Doctors of Madness. Proto-punksky Doctor of Madness. You know, so like, hmm. And then what will you tell Miss Lubimov what you've got prepared for him today? I've got Cleopatra's speech on here. <laughs> Mark Anthony is married. <laughs> anyway, long story short, uh, I did it, and Lubimov, bless him, saw something in this, either in the, the 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 sheer brass neck of the person who was doing it, or something so uh, uh, unorthodox about my 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 performance. And he said, "Come back tomorrow with the part of the player king from Hamlet prepared." Uh, this was the worst thing I could imagine. I wanted him to either to say, I never want to see you again, <laughs> or you are the new Laurence Olivier. I didn't yes. want him to say, come back and put yourself through this ritual humiliation all over again. So I had to come back the next day with the player King prepared. Uh, and Lubimov by now was sort of, he, he sort of liked me and he, he said, da, da, Hadasho, thank you very much. Come back tomorrow with the same part prepared, but as if Wagner had directed you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Mr. Lupe Boss, it's very kind of you, and I'm absolutely touched and, and uh, humbled that you would ask me back for a, a third time. Tomorrow I have to go to Germany to, I was mixing a record, an engine room record in Germany. 
I say it's been a great pleasure meeting you and thank you for your, uh, your advice and, 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 and for your time. He said, okay. And then three days later, I got a call from my agent saying, Lubimov has been in touch. He wants you to play the player king, the grave digger, and the ghost in Hamlet. And you're going to Hong Kong, to Australia, to Japan, to Poland, to Germany, to over the next two years, put a line through your life. Wow. 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 Exactly. So, you know, I don't... I, that must have been a life-changing experience, having two years doing Absolutely, two. yeah. No, my marriage didn't survive it, of course. Um, it, was, it was brilliant. It was as if that tour had been arranged by someone uh, who could see into the future. We were in Berlin when the wall was coming down. We were in Japan in cherry blossom time. We were in Australia when England were playing cricket there. You know, everything I love in the world <laughs> happened on that tour, you know. So um, it was fantastic. And I made friends for life. I was the grave digger and the other grave digger was James Nesbitt, the Irish actor. Yeah. He and I, he'd just come out of drama college and, and we just did... Alas, poor Yorick, every night, you know, around the world for, for two years. My God. And it was hilarious, you know. And, did, that, uh, did, that, um, did that experience kind of change you somewhat? Yeah, it, it did. It, it, in, in several ways, actually, it, it gave me a confidence. It gave me a confidence that I realized there were two sorts of artists in the world, those who say yes, to a challenge and those who say no to a challenge. And it, it emboldened me going forward to say yes to everything that I thought I might ever enjoy in my life uh, and not to be deterred by anything as trivial as lack of experience, lack of skill, lack of talent, <laughs> lack of expertise. <laughs> yes, they're just minor, minor hiccups on the, on the train, aren't they, really? Yeah. But yes. Uh, Two years, came back 1990 or something, and then um, I don't know really what I did in the 90s, but it was much more of the same. I did uh, Robin Hood, uh, you know, I was the uh, executioner in, in the Robin Hood movie, and I was in, um, uh, I lived in Berlin for a while. I became art critic uh, for. Art Monthly. I was the European editor of Art Monthly magazine in Berlin. I lived in Berlin for a long while. And um, uh, at the end of the 90s, I worked with Martin Scorsese and in Gangs of New York in, uh, in Rome, in Chilicita, which was a terrifying experience because it was huge budget working on a big outdoor lot they, which they turned into New York 1856 or whenever that film set and I only had a small role in it but uh, I remember getting out there and we're just walking through the role and Scorsese was absolutely lovely and charming and I was playing an undertaker trying to sell coffins to um a grieving mother. And so they flooded the back lot and they were bringing in ships and they had cattle and sheep getting on and off the boats for my shot, you know. Uh, and I was walking this grieving mother down the quayside as the coffins are being unloaded on the boat. So it's a huge shot. And I've got to do it in some very specific accent that has been decided for me by a dialogue coach who has to earn his money by giving me something that I can't do very well so he can keep jumping <laughs> in, right? Uh, and make himself uh, um, indispensable. So we're doing that. And something happened that never happened to me before in my life in, in, in acting. I just blanked on the lines. So we'd done it, we'd filmed it, we'd got it, and we're doing another take. And so, to set up each take took an hour or an hour and a half, 
hour and a half. It would be Scorsese saying, okay, back to first positions, take the boats back out. <laughs> take, put the <laughs> sheep back on the, you know, put the cattle back on the boat. <laughs> put, you know, put Leonardo back in his rowing boat. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell, you must have felt yeah. like I'm really it's sorry, insane. guys. I've... Yeah. So blanking uh, out is quite a moment in a Scorsese film, really, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, and he was the nicest man alive. And I don't know if you saw him, his, his uh, programs with, uh, what's his name, uh, Fred, Fred Lieberman. Have I you seen see him? No, I didn't. Uh, brilliant, brilliant. And, and, you know, and his Bob Dylan stuff is brilliant. And, and his, his George Harrison film is brilliant. But retrospectively, if I could have been in any Scorsese film, it wouldn't have been Gangs of New York, because I don't think that's one of his best. You know, it's not... King of Comedy, it's not Taxi Driver, it's not Mean Streets, it's not, um, what's that one called? Uh, Raging uh, Bull. Raging Bull, you know, it's not, it's not one of those. Um, but, you know, I'm a kid from a South London Comprehensive School, I'm a failed pop star, and I'm working with Martin Scorsese, or I'm working with Jack Nicholson on, on Batman, or I'm working with Tim Burton, or I'm working, go forward, 2003, I'm at a party and there's a guy there called uh, Robert Wilson, who's a theatre director, American theatre director. And um, I'm chatting to him and I'm a big, big fan of Robert Wilson. He did something called uh, Einstein on the Beach with Philip Glass and uh, Lucinda Charles in the early 70s. Hugely ambitious multimedia uh, theatre. And I said to him, what are you doing? in London, he said, well, I'm over here casting for um, a Tom Waits thing uh, called The Black Rider, which has been written by William Burroughs. You know, and I'm thinking, this is for me. <laughs> you know. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're doing uh, probably two years of shows. Um, I said, yeah, well, when are you doing this? He said, I'm, do I, I'm doing this at the Barbican tomorrow. You know. I said, will you see me? He said, yeah, you come in, bring a guitar or something. So I went in uh, the next day at the Barbican and they're doing the auditions. And he said, do you know any of Tom Waits' songs? Of course I know Tom Waits' songs, but am I an idiot? Have I got idiot written on my back? <laughs> am, am I gonna sing a Tom Waits song for Tom Waits? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I took, I, took, I took the guitar in and sang something that sounded a bit like a song. Where shall I run when the brave fire comes? Who's gonna save us? You know, I do, some, I do something of mine. I it sounds a bit like, mind. it's like Underground, isn't it? His song, um... From Sword Peach Trondine. Yeah, exactly. It's something like that. I think I'm not going to do a Tom Waits song, but I'm going to do something that like Tom might like. So they put it on film. The next day I get the call. Yeah, Tom really liked it. Do you want to do this show, uh, Black Rider? We we open at the uh, the Barbican. Marianne Faithful is playing the lead, um, and we've got a brilliant band. And William Burroughs has written the screen uh, the stage play. Um, and then we go to San Francisco, then we go to Sydney, and then we go to Los Angeles, and that's it for the next two years. <laughs> wow, that's... Yeah, so, yeah. Amazing. yeah so I, I did that, I, I, I got that, and I loved it. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, and then, just as the last show was finishing in Los Angeles, so the last of the four uh, places we'd gone, uh, I was back in London, again at a party, and I met a guy, and we were talking, and we were making each other laugh, and he was a big music fan, and um, he was telling me stories about punk rock. He's an American guy. And uh, just as I'm about to leave the party, he says, hey, 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 what are you doing in uh, July? And I said, um, I, well, I, I 
come back from LA in June. Uh, so I'm unemployed, I'm on the scrap heap. He said, do you want to play Abraham Lincoln in my movie? The movie? And, and we've been speaking for an, hour, for an hour, but I didn't know he was a filmmaker. We'd just been talking about music. He said, my name's Harmony Korean. I'm making a movie called uh, Mr. Lonely. And I, I love Harmony Korean's work. I, I didn't know it was him, but I love Gummo and Kids and Julian Donkey Boy and all that stuff. And um, I said, yeah, oh God, yeah, tell me. He said, we're filming it in Scotland. It's about a group of uh, retired impersonators. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've got Samantha Morton playing uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe. I've got Diego Luna, the Mexican actor playing Michael Jackson. I've got a uh, brilliant French actor, Denis Levant playing Charlie Chaplin. Anita Pallenberg is playing the Queen. James Fox is playing the Pope. Do you want to play Abraham Lincoln? And, you know, I'm, I'm there again. And we're up in Scotland and we did this movie and, you know, we, yeah, just did it. Uh, 2004, no, 2007, 2008, I guess. Just, I'm just lucky, you know, and, you know, since then I did some more stuff with the club. I opened Cabaret Patrol. I met my wife who's saved my life more than I care to. Yes. Yeah. So, did, no, just coming up to the, the current, did you have, because this is where my brain sometimes freezes, did you have one of those lucky moments where someone you bump into someone on the beach and says, "Oh, I'll finance." I did. You. Was that we were we were on the, on the beach in France about four years ago, and I got a call. That's right. And a, a guy says, "Look, you don't know me. My name's Steve Homer." I said, "Hi." He said, "I'm sorry. Is it convenient?" I said, "Yeah, go on." He said, 20 years ago, I was the social secretary at Nottingham University or something, and I booked you to do the Phenomenal Rise of Richard Strange show, and I loved it. Oh, that's really lovely of you, Steve. Thanks a lot. No, 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 no. He says, wait, wait, wait. I now own the biggest agency in the world <laughs> called AEG Presents, and your show has stayed with me for so long. Would you consider doing it again uh, if I could book you a tour. Uh, and I said, yeah. He said, great, okay. Uh, call me when you're back in London and we'll work out some dates. And what about Doctors of Madness? I said, yeah, Doctors of Madness, is, um, I'd quite like to do some stuff with them again now because um, I've been to Japan many times, played Doctors of Madness songs, not with the old band, but with some musicians that I met over there who had been a Docs and Madness tribute band. Uh, and I just love playing with them. So I'd go to, <laughs> I'd go to Japan as, as a Docs and Madness. But I was, I was heading up my own tribute band. It was just bonkers. Um, so he said, yeah, well, we'll do some Docs and Madness dates and we'll do some Phenomenal Rise dates. I said, great, okay. So. Around that time, I went into hospital and I was ill. I had a cancer scare and I was, I was feeling my mortality and all the rest. <laughs> um, I started writing uh, a new Doctors of Madness album thinking I haven't done the Doctors of Madness album that I'd like to be remembered by. But although I'm 40 years late for it, <laughs> I think I'd quite like to write it now. So I started writing these songs in hospital. Yeah. And um, these summers kept coming and I knew it was political. This was 2018, I think. I knew it was political because it was Brexit and it was Trump and it was fascism and it was control. It was all those things that doctors of madness had always sung about, but I hadn't maybe articulated with the sophistication or with the skill that I, 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 I now have. I wrote Star Drive. And then I wasn't sure I'd written all this stuff and I'd got home and I demoed it in this room. And I just thought I'm being delusional here. 
Um, so I thought I'm just going to send these songs to someone I trust, which is John Leckie, a record producer who produced the second Doctor's and Madness album back in 1976, but had then gone on to do Stone Roses and uh, uh, Radiohead and uh, uh, Muse and oh, loads and loads of stuff. And I sent the songs to John and he got back to me the next day. He said, this is brilliant. We've got to make this album. How much money have you got? And I said, 10 quid. <laughs> <laughs> 10 quid and a lot of enthusiasm, you know. He said, well, no, no, really, how much have you got? I said, I could probably raise about 5,000 quid. He said, fine. Are you OK working 16 hours a day in a residential studio outside London? I said, yeah. He booked the studio. He said, I booked it for two weeks. We're going to have to work really, really fast. I got my two musicians over from Japan. We started working. And my stepdaughter, who's a brilliant singer, was coming in and singing with me. And the songs were sounding good. And, and then something magical happened. I got calls from people who'd been Doctors of Madness fans. And Joe Elliott from Def Leppard phoned up and said, I hear you've started working on a new um, Doctors album. I said, yeah. He said, fucking hell, man. We used to come and see you every fucking Yorkshire gig you fucking did. He said, I want to be your fucking backing vocalist on this. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Joe's on like six of the tracks on um, Dark Times. And Terry Edwards, saxophone player, um, who'd been in the band for Black Rider, uh, Tom Waits thing, he said, I want to be on it. And Sarah Jane Morris said, I want to be on it. And, um, uh, you know, suddenly I've got these amazing people playing on this record. And we did Dark Times, and that came out very late 2019. I got great reviews and it was very timely because it was very political. It was very, this lurch to the right, you know, this populism and this, this uh, incipient fascism that we're really enjoying now. And um, then, uh, yeah, I, about six months ago, Martin Ware, from Human League and Heaven 17, who I work with at a university, said, you know, you were the only band we ever used to come and see before Human League because everyone else was crap, but we used to come and see Doctors of Madness whenever you play. <laughs> he said, do you want me to remix anything from this album? <laughs> so I said, well, let me give you the tracks so you tell me what you want to remix. And so today, literally today, uh, a, a track called Walk of Shame has just been come out, and the Martin, the Martin Ware remix has come out today uh, from that album. So, I mean, this is this weird book ending of 45 years of my life. From the time I first went on the road with doctors in 1974, 75, to Martin Ware, who's now Professor Ware, and you know, and, and you know, a real boffin and. Joe Elliott and uh, you know all these people are on it, and Joe's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and he sold twenty zillion records, you know. And Martin's done the same, and I'm just like lucky. I'm lucky, <laughs> which is which is fantastic. Which does also, apart from the release, which is kind of amazing, it, it's it's brilliant. But there is also your memoir, which as well is coming out, isn't it, as an audio book? <laughs> This book, which I just had, to have which is, um, um... which yeah, it's called Strange Punks and Drunks and Flicks and Kicks, and it came out when I was fifty years old. I thought I'm old enough to write a memoir because now they do it when they're eighteen years old, you know. But yes, by the time I was fifteen, uh, fifteen, fifty, I'd done the doctor's stuff. I'd lived through. I was born in nineteen fifty one, so I'd lived through all but three weeks of the second half of the 20th century. I was born January 51. So I lived in this golden period when to be white, male, English speaking, living in London was like being hit with the lucky stick, you know. To grow up in London in the 60s, uh, you know, it's just like 
it's probably like growing up in Thebes in 3000 BC, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was that lucky. <laughs> or, or, you know, or in Athens in, in 100 BC, you know, to be, to be Athenian and male and uh, to be in Athens in 100 or 200 BC was just being hit with the lucky stick. And so it was growing up in London in the 60s. And, you know, so my generation, rightly or wrongly, think we invented everything from civil rights to human rights to women's rights to gay rights to environmentalism, you know, all those things that uh, we were lucky enough to, to be part of in the 60s and 70s. And then, you know, to live through a period when music really meant something, music was the thing. Yes, uh, this is true. Not poetry, not painting, not ballet. You know, music, pop music was the, the thing. You, you, you were, uh, uh, if not respected, you were listened to and you were accorded some sort of uh, uh, voice. Uh, and, you know, I was lucky as a kid who went to a... a um, a comprehensive school in Brixton who didn't go to university but did get a guitar and did find a way out of this crippling conventionality of a lower middle class white family, which is what we were. Uh, and as always for people like me, there's a teacher in the background somewhere who switched on a light and said, if you like Bob Dylan, you might like Allen Ginsberg, you might like Dylan Thomas, you might like yes. William Black, you know. You might like you might like Shakespeare, you know. Uh, would you like to come to the theatre with the theatre group and go and see a play by someone called Harold Pinter in 1964? You know, and my parents would be like, "You're going where to the theatre?" <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, just just so lucky, you know. So, so the book, you know, is. Uh, it's it's written with uh, uh, a sort of not a tongue in cheek, but a, a realization uh, of um, how lucky I am, and that I am where I am as much through luck as through talent, uh, and that people have been good to me, and that fortune has been good to me, and that friends have been good to me. Uh, and I haven't always been good to friends and I haven't always been good to my talent. But now, when lockdown started last year, I thought I should read that book and I should put in a lot of the stuff that I didn't put in to the print version, uh, either because the publisher thought it wasn't of interest or because they thought it was controversial or they thought it would turn people off or whatever. And so I just read the whole thing unabridged, unexpurgated, and unapologetic, really. And that's what's coming out. I think it comes out next week as a, a, an audio book, next week or the week after. So will, will this be something that you stream, or will you actually buy a physical copy? You, you, you download the entire... You'll be delighted to hear that it's not... It's not read in real time, so it's not going to take you 51 years to listen to it. But it must <laughs> up the first 51 years of my life, or 50 years. Because the, the book originally came out, I think, in 2004. And I think I finished it in, in 2002. Right. So it was, when I got to 50, I thought I could write a book now. Yes. And because, you know, pop culture being what it is, if you've got a name to drop, life is easier. And if you can drop the names of the Sex Pistols and Jack Nicholson and Tim Burton and Martin Scorsese and Marianne Faithful and blah, 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 blah Damien Hurst or whoever, um, you're more likely to get someone say, oh, I'll take a punt on that. So I did find a publisher for it. Um, and it it was it, it was well received, but you know, like all these things, they're quite ephemeral. Um, and I'm mindful of that. Pop culture is, by definition, something that's quite ephemeral. And so it went into decline. Then I sort of 
thought I could do a, 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 a live show based around a few readings of it, telling some stories and, um, and singing some songs. And then I was sort of up and running. So I did that for the like two or three years. And then I just thought I might as well put it out as a, an audio book. And yes. Yeah. And, and, because and, um, interesting enough, just on that point, I know that, um, I know, I know that Hazel O'Connor kind of, when she hit a certain rock bottom, was at Edinburgh Festival and saw someone performing and then just saw them with their sort of suitcase of merchandise at the end and, and then <laughs> said to her, look, Hazel, you know, this is what you have to do now. You know, I know you had a yeah. number one and you were a big star, but you, you didn't read the small print, you didn't make any money. And what yeah. else are you going to do? Make, make your life, you know, a performance. And then that's when I saw her at the Norwich Arts Centre doing her life with you know the songs that she put on that particular album and probably some others so it's did you the right way to work as well it's it's very self-contained it all goes into a car you know you don't rely on anyone else you you, you can sell the t-shirt and sell the book and sell the cd but you know you're not beholden to a record company and there's no managers or you know people trying to push you in one way or another i think it's part of getting older as well is that if by the age of 70 you haven't got any confidence in what you've done you're probably not going to get it by the time you're 80 you know <laughs> but if if you can take a, a backward glance and just think you know what that was a sort of zealot like story of if i'm not center stage then i'm a bit part player in so many of these great moments of popular culture whether it's punk rock and malcolm mclaren or whether it's batman or whether it's working with tom waits or with damien hurst or whoever or damon Albarn, or working with jarvis cocker or working on german tv with the spice girls and grace jones you know it's it's all all right actually and i've got i'm not apologetic for it anymore i'm, I'm thinking i'm the only guy who's done what i've done and yes. written about it, and is now teaching master's level students about the value of taking risks. You know, so it's, it's, uh, it is well on that on almost that last point because I think your partner's just given you the bottle of wine. Um, yes, I, there's a lot of people I've met recently who have are now lecturing, and I know this one guy who was who played loads of bands, including. Pete Murphy also wrote sort of lots of songs with people like Dido, who obviously sold millions, but you yeah. know, has a lecturing job with you know two different colleges and does that as well as does the music. So it's the sort of the great balancing act that you have to do. Yeah, also, and I love it actually. I mean, I, I learn as much from the students as they learn from me, I'm sure. And also it does it does contextualize what it is that you've done, where you've been. And, and 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 the people that you've met you know it's it's not a long way away from picasso and debussy and dijinsky and ballet russe you know for, for the the second half of the 20th century uh i did meet them all i did meet john lennon only for a minute but i met john lennon you know i met uh uh you know Tom Waits and Marianne and, and I'd worked with Anita Pallenberg and she told me how whenever she and Keith used to crash the car, the, the trick was always to hide your drugs between the car crash and your home so you could pick them up after the police had gone rather than have to go back for them after they'd gone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So look, the book, I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be one of those enjoyable read, um, read, <laughs> listens in the garden, isn't it, really? Let's face yeah, it. Yeah, it'll be an enjoyable listen in the garden, I promise you. And I, I put music on it as well. And as I say, there's a, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff that's in the audio version that's not in the printed version just because they wanted to cut it down or because they didn't think it was relevant. And in, in retrospect, some of this stuff is relevant. My idea for the book originally, uh, and 
this will come as a shock for someone who's just spoken more or less non-stop about himself for an hour and a half, is that I wanted myself very small in the foreground and I wanted the world large in the background. Yes. For the reasons I've just said, that I, I grew up through civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, environmentalism, you know, the, 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 uh, um, uh, the celebration of the teenager and, and, and all that stuff. And growing up at a time when to be in London, to be young, to be male, to be white, to be English speaking, and to be in the music business was like being hit with a lucky stick. Um, so I thought that's quite a nice thread to have going along the front, but um, in the back to have, you know, what it was to grow up in London in the 1950s with rationing still happening uh, to, and, and bomb sites and prefabs and, you know, that uh, obedience to authority until Elvis Presley comes along and then the Beatles come along and then the Stones come along and then the pretty things come along and then Bob Dylan comes along, you know, and then psychedelia and drugs come along and woo, <laughs> off we go. <laughs> we off we go indeed. I think your partner's looking for some more drink. Ah, <laughs> Yeah. Look, just lastly, just very lastly then, um, if you were to, if you could have said something to an 18 year old self start, 16, 18 year old self starting out, I mean, is there something that you would have just kind of wanted to whisper in their ear, either advice or encouragement, just as, uh, you know, that you've learned over the decades that you think, yeah, yeah. That, that's something that... I, I, I think it would say, don't, don't ever let anyone tell you you can't, that you're not good enough or that you're not born the right way or you know you're not from the right family no I mean nothing I have ever done would be predicted from the family that I've come from uh, we hated music and we hated anything that ended with a vowel like spaghetti or coffee you know, <laughs> or, you know, um, but, but it, it, especially Verdi or, or, or you know Donizetti or Picasso we hated any of that stuff, you know. We suspected it was suspicious. We 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 were we were very very suspicious of all that stuff. <laughs> That's a great line, actually. I'm gonna copy that. <laughs> Right, that's good. Look, I better let you, but thanks a lot. If you like, like I can always, uh, when I do this, send you the link and then you can put it on whatever places you do these sort of, you know, social media Fabulous. sites. And I'll put those as well. But look, really hope you come to um, tour again very soon. Because um, Oh uh, God, I would love to. I can't wait to work again. I know, this is all good. But luckily, it's um, hopefully going to change this year. So Yeah, I think so. Fingers crossed. I've already, I, I, yeah, I've got the t-shirts already loaded in the car. I know, the suitcase is there, isn't it? God, I know <laughs> the point. God, that'll be great. Look, well, look, take care of yourself, Richard. Thank you ever so much for your time. And, Thank um, you so much. And thanks for being, you know, you're very easy to work with. Thank you. <laughs> okay, take care. Take and, care. Have a great yeah. weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. And that, dear listener, is how you end a conversation. I love leaving those bits in. Anyway, that was me in conversation with Richard Strange. If you want to find out any more, find out any more information about Richard and his latest projects, you can just Google away. He's going to be all over social media and probably elsewhere. Um, I do know that uh, his audio book, which is memoir, Strange Punks and Drunks, Flicks and Kicks, is available. So uh, do check that out. It's going to be a riveting listen, and especially with his amazing voice. Anyway, look, this has been David Eastall, The C86 Show. If you want to contact me for some interesting reason, make it positive, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. Also, all these have been archived. I know, just in case. There's a lot of 80s indie bands, as well as quite an obsession with David Bowie. I will tell you more later. But uh, you can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, just do C86 Show, and uh, they might send you to sleep. But they're also quite interesting, so um, fill your boots. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe. <laughs>